Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Last month, we ventured to Brandon, Manitoba amidst the buzz of the 2024 Association of Manitoba Municipalities Conference. Now, amidst the conference, we seized the opportunity to engage with local leaders from across the province of Manitoba. We delve into the pressing issues confronting communities and their accomplishments firsthand, amplifying the voices of municipal leaders and offering insights into the diverse challenges and accomplishments faced by communities in the province. So we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Steve Langston from the rural municipality of Harrison Park. In the heart of every thriving community lies a well-crafted strategic plan. But crafting such a plan requires expertise, experience, and a deep understanding of local needs. Enter Strategic Steps, your partner in municipal strategic planning. Strategic Steps team of experts have years of experience in municipal administration. At Strategic Steps, they just don't develop plans. They co-create homegrown strategies tailored to your unique community. They listen, they collaborate, they empower your community to thrive. Contact Strategic Steps today and take the first step towards a brighter future for your municipality. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by asking a simple question, but it's an overarching one. Yeah. Where's your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Steve? Well, that's a great question. Um, I guess I have this uh, bit of a disorder where I have a hard time uh, driving past things and seeing things and thinking, oh, this could maybe be better and not doing anything about it. I feel, you know, I have a sense of my mortality. I just turned 40, think we're maybe half done here. So, you know, I'm very big on just like gaining as much experience and uh, just doing it because I think leadership has to be something that starts at a young age. I mean, developing leadership skills when you retire isn't great. You know, you're tuckered out, you're declining, your brain is starting to calcify. Mine already feels like it is some days. So um, I've always just been big on leadership and, you know, especially in our rural communities, it's it's not, you can't just say, oh, I'll let the next person do it. There's just not enough people around. And then, you know, I just feel like I've been, I guess I feel like I have had the opportunity to live a life of a little bit of privilege, you know, came from a stable home, got a good education, came out debt free, kind of, I've always felt like a bit of a, my, my parents and my grandparents have worked very hard to set me up in this position. I just don't think it would make sense to just send it in and do something that I'm not passionate about. So what was the draw to the municipal realm at the end of the day? Because we speak to municipal leaders and it's always interesting to find out why they chose municipal rather than school board or provincial or federal yeah. or volunteerism. Yeah, so I started to, in probably like the last five years have a real interest in governance. Uh, I, I recognized that it was something that I really didn't understand a lot about. You know, I, I, I'd go in for an application to council meeting. It was kind of cryptic. I didn't really understand what was happening. And I didn't like that. So, um, you know, I ran for our local credit union, got on as a director there. It's a 20 branch, $2 billion organization. Um, so started gaining some experience there. And then, um, you know, we're very involved in our small community in our region. Um, and I just felt like, I feel like, um, it's really important to have diverse representation on these councils. And, you know, I think it's systemically, uh, they're set up for retired people and farmers, you know, and, and I don't think that's right. And I think that as a young, young parent and a young entrepreneur, young community member, um, if I had the opportunity to do it, that I felt like I wanted to represent that demographic. So what was What's been the biggest eye-opening experience for yourself? Because you were a first-term counselor yeah. now. You've been on both sides of the table. You've done the applications. Now yeah. you're looking at the applications. What's been the biggest eye-opening experience for yourself? And what would you say, what advice would you give that potential new 40-year-old person who's thinking about getting involved rurally in their municipality to say, okay, if you want to be set up for good success, this is what you should do? Yeah, well, it's just very interesting because, you know, you're, in my small business, I kind of handpick who I work with. I handpick <laughs> my clients. And in a municipal council, you're thrown in with, you know, six or seven different people that, you know, maybe you have nothing in common with. And um, 
and hopefully everyone gets along and works efficiently, but typically that's not always the case. Um, so, you know, I think a big skill is like understanding how to work with people that maybe have a different mindset or perspective than you. Um, and then I think the biggest, uh, the biggest benefit that I think you could have is to have mentorship. Um, so especially in that first year, you know, things are happening and you don't, you don't really know where to turn, yeah. right? It's like, okay, well, why is this happening? Or how do I deal with, you know, there's a symptom or a situation on the table, but, you know, you don't really understand how to tie that to a policy or to ha how to tie that to a bylaw or, or how do I actually, um, you know, gain consensus and try to tackle this problem? Often you want to tackle the problem, but do you have the tools in your toolbox to really be able to do that? And I think being able to just uh, call someone with a lifetime of experience that's been there, done that, and get their perspective, someone that's outside of council, outside of your administration, uh, can provide a lot of value. Do you think there's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics prior to people getting involved or prior to you getting involved? You had some knowledge of what was going on in the background because you were applying. You were applying for grants or applying for variances permits, or, variances. Yeah. The average person, and I say this with a broad stroke and I hate doing this, but the average person I would assume doesn't know that, doesn't understand the intricate workings of what a municipality does or how to work through the process of the municipality in Harrison Park, do you feel like that is the case or do you think people actually understand? I think some people are engaged. I think that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, smart people in that municipality that, that do understand. But I mean, I heard someone say yesterday, people only really get engaged when <laughs> in municipal politics when you like hit them in the pocketbooks or you annoy them, yeah. right? So, um, you know, I think, but that's something that I'm, I'm really trying to change and you know that's why I do like a weekly update on Instagram or a update after every council meeting because I want more people to be engaged I want them to be thinking about it and I don't want to just be communicating in times of crisis or you know when I have a uh, I need to rally the troops against this person or that idea like we're being paid to be here and I think we're accountable um, to our constituents doesn't mean I'm going to take like every phone call Saturday morning like no but I think because I communicate well I don't get a lot of phone calls. I think people kind of know what I'm up to. And then when they have something to talk about, they have context. So um, I think there is apathy, but I think people want to be engaged. But I feel like waiting through minutes um, that are posted to the website doesn't tell a very good story. And you kind of end up frustrated. You're like, well, what does that decision mean? Why was that decision made? What's the backstory? And, and I think that no one's going to want to watch a 20 minute uh, uh, or two hour yeah. YouTube video of a council meeting. If it's I even, enjoy it. If it's even posted. <laughs> That's true. You know, and um, our neighboring municipality, I've I've been at where we do a lot of business. I've been advocating that they asking if they would post their council there to YouTube. And no, no. they won't do it. You know, <laughs> we're, we're working on getting an agenda out. But that's, that's their their show. So I want to turn to Harrison Park as a whole now, yes. and I want to ask this question, but I want to preface it as I always do on the show, that this is a conversation between myself and you. Yeah. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not a policy of council. Yeah. This is your opinion. Just yeah. want to make sure that's of on the course. record. In your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest challenge facing Harrison Parks today? Um, I think the, I mean, we have a very unique community because for the most part it is, um, well, especially the, the ward that I represent on all, okay, it's diverse. The <laughs> large amount of our assessment is seasonal cabins. It's on the okay. edge of a national park. Yep. Um, and, and, but you know, we have agriculture, um, so it's agriculture and tourism is kind of what's going on there. Um, huge opportunity for small businesses. Um, our biggest challenge in my perspective is att attack, attracting more young families uh, that want to live there. So housing um, and housing affordability uh, for people that want to move there full time is a challenge. Um, do you so, think you're doing a good enough job doing that? No. I mean, how, how well, do you of council attract more people to your community? Well, the, the problem is, is that any housing gets swallowed up by baby boomers that want to buy it for <laughs> cabins, right? Yeah. So, so if you wanted to do condos for young families, it's like, oh, that'd make a good cabin. Or, you know, someone starts um, a trailer park. It's like, well, would this be good for Stavacom or would it be better as seasonal RV lots? So it's very difficult because it drives up the cost of land. Um, and so you just, you really have to be creative. We have um, outlying communities that are starting to grow. Um, so, so to me, that's our biggest challenge. Uh, outside of that, um, you know, cabin development 
in its nature is very hodgepodge. Um, we have a lot of topography, so it makes servicing it from an infrastructure perspective challenging. You know, we're working very hard to get water into our um, into all of our homes, um, but rising infrastructure costs make that difficult. Also, everyone has a well, so it's difficult to to say, hey, we're going to tag you for 20 grand here when they have a well that they deem to be uh, perfectly good. Yeah. So um, so to me, those are some of the challenges is like, how do we get a stronger local long term uh, com- community and economy? Right now, we have so many trades coming from out of area to do business there. Um, so from my perspective, that's what I would really like to see is just a stronger local service economy. So how do you do that? Because there's probably people, if I go up to Harrison Parks today and I ask 100 people in your community, we don't want it to change. We, we love it the way that it is. Mm-hmm. We love that it's a, that's why we moved here. Mm-hmm. That's why we keep, stay here. How do you balance that aspect of the long-term longevity of your community with the individual needs of your community? Because people will say... I, I, I like it the way it is, the nimbyism, if you will. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult, right? <laughs> because, um, you know, people like their large lots and they like that the fact that there's empty uh, space in between them. Um, so, so it's difficult, but I mean, you know, we have people that move in from out of the area and they're like, oh, they love the vibrancy. They love that they can go get a great meal. And it's like, well, who do you think's running that restaurant? Yeah. You know, who, who? why do you think that's here? That's here because of tourism. Um, and and so it's difficult. People come from their quiet small town to retire, and then they want it to be just like their quiet small town. But you got to remember, this is like cabin country. And, you know, you can't expect that you're going to know everyone that walks up and down your street because cabin could be shared by three different family members. It could be their partner, their client, or whoever. So um, it's different, and people like that, um, but not always. So flip side of that question is, what does Harrison Park get right? What is the thing that you think that you are doing good right now and you can do a little bit better, but because you always can improve on yeah, everything. The, the What's be- the thing that you look at and you say, okay, we're, the be- we've got this right. The best thing we do is offer, I think, the most unparalleled outdoor lifestyle in the entire province. Yeah. I mean, um, it's uh, basically on the escarpment of a mountain. We've got a 3,000 square kilometer national park uh, directly to the north of us. Um, you know, countless kilometers of trails, golfing, lakes, um, you know, all sorts of activities year round. So if you want to raise uh, your children in a place that will give them a great respect and love for the outdoors, if you don't want to lock your keys, if you want to see the northern lights, if you want to hear coyotes howling, you You're know, painting a beautiful picture for me, man. It, it's beautiful, and it, it truly is. And like, I think. I, I try so hard not to take it for granted, but it's like virtually impossible, right? And then every May, April, you know, it's starting to get a lot busy and you're just like, why are these people coming here? You know, like where, where are all these people from? And it's like, these are the people that are working 48 weeks a year to come here for four. And, and so, you know, we've, it, it's virtually impossible not to take um, the quality of life that we have for granted. So, so that is what we do very, very well. So my last question then is, and it's the million dollar question because I think every municipal leader knows how to answer it. What makes Harrison Park such a unique place to live, work and raise a family? It's just the, it's that high quality of life. You know, it's, um, it's the Northern lights. It's the walking and seeing wildlife, um, kids playing in the yard, not locking your, car um you know it's it's to me our municipality is the most beautiful municipality and i'm sure others think that and there's some beautiful spots in manitoba but like i mean the traffic counts the tourist counts don't lie it's like there's a reason that there's a national park on our doorstep it's a totally unique spot in manitoba it's on the side of a mountain um and, and i just think it's that and then you know people have people don't end up in Harrison Park because their car broke down and the, like it's a place that you got to work hard you know there's not a million middle class jobs there you got to work hard you got to you know find a house that'll work for you it's not an easy place to move to but when you get there the lifestyle and quality of life is totally unparalleled. Councillor thank you so much for doing this always a pleasure. Absolutely. We want to thank the Association of Manitoba Municipalities for inviting us to this year's Spring Convention in Brandon, Manitoba. This episode would not have been possible without their support. 
Now, if you've enjoyed today's episode, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, the local government at work. We are your go-to source for comprehensive municipal coverage from across Canada, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged on the issues affecting municipalities. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in amplifying the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.